So good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a webinar on behalf of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies um, Young Neurosurgeon Forum, and it's the next in our um, webinar series. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Isabel Germano about the challenges and opportunities faced in brain tumor surgery. Um, thanks so much for being with us today, Dr. Germano. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll just do a brief introduction and then um, some introductory questions, and then we can just get to the meat of your talk, if that's all right with you. Perfect. Thank you, Megan. All right. Um, so Dr. Germano is the director of the Mount Sinai Comprehensive Brain Tumor Program, um, which works in computer-assisted and image-guided brain mapping um, to work towards minimally invasive treatments of brain tumors. Um, she's also the co-director of the radio surgery program there as well. Uh, her main interests lie in brain tumors, epilepsy surgery, radio surgery, and computer-assisted image-guided surgery. Uh, she is extremely active in the neurosurgical leadership and education realm, and was previously the executive, um, an executive committee member for the Congress of uh, Neurosurgery and on the board of directors for the American Association of Neurological Surgeons as well as an executive committee member of the ANS-CNS Joint Section on Tumors and a scientific program member for the American Epilepsy Society. So busy, busy lady. Um, recently, she's also been the director uh, for the, an advanced technique in image-guided brain and spine surgery course, um, which uh, has neurosurgeons, is attended by neurosurgeons from around the world. Uh, so to start us off this morning, uh, we'll just do a few quick questions. Uh, so it seems, Dr. Germano, like you have a pretty wide array of interest uh, spanning from tumors to functional neurosurgery and incorporating new technology and image guidance in that as well. Can you give us a little bit of uh, history and background on how you got interested in oncology and brain tumors specifically? Yes, thank you, Megan. This was a, uh, a great introduction. So although my CV um, has a numerous uh, fields of, of neurosurgery, my passion and where I started from and where I, uh, I always have been practicing is neuro-oncology. Now, um, because uh, I was encouraged when I was a resident to really look into what could expand um, the toolbox of a um, brain tumor surgeon uh, in looking into something that was not just the specific of a neuro-oncology uh, fellowship. Then I pursued an epilepsy fellowship and a, a stereotactic functional and epilepsy fellowship. So in those days, um, those three, functional stereotactic and um, epilepsy were, were joined. And I'm really, really glad that I did that um, because I think that it really helped me throughout my career uh, taking care of my patients to broaden my knowledge to those fields. And so um, when I was at Montreal Neurological Institute to do my uh, functional epilepsy stereotactic um, fellowship is where I learned about uh, radio surgery, right? So, so mm -hmm. at MNI, uh, when I was there, we did one of the very first uh, radio surgery procedures uh, that were done. And so all that knowledge accompanied me for the rest of my life and made me interested then in starting the program at Sinai. Uh, similar, and by the way, uh, as you said, um, the, the program at Sinai is a dual program, neurosurgery and radiation oncology. And then that is very important. I believe that that is a very, very important. And then similarly uh, for, the, for the epilepsy part, although I gained a tremendous amount of knowledge in epilepsy surgery from both Dr. Olivier and Dr. Yassergill in, in Switzerland, that knowledge um, helped me uh, not because I wanted to enter the field of epilepsy surgery, which I was forced to do due to lack of personnel at the time, but ultimately because it helps me when I take care of patients with brain tumor to really have a broader understanding. So to answer your question, I uh, went into uh, the School of Medicine because I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I did uh, the equivalent of an MD PhD uh, with a full thesis that took five years to, uh, uh, to prepare and conclude on um, immunohistochemistry of brain tumors. When I finished my uh, dual degree, I had a grant in brain tumors. 
And I continued on uh, doing research in brain tumors and taking care of patients with brain tumors um, by uh, broadening my knowledge in, in fields that were on the side. Well, that, that makes a, a whole lot of sense. It seems that the radio surgery and the image guidance fit perfectly into your very long-term uh, interest in brain tumors and how best to treat them. Um, I also saw you have an MBA uh, during all that time. It looks like you got an additional degree as well. Um, how do you incorporate that degree and those, uh, those teachings into your practice? Yeah, so that's an interesting um it's an interesting question. So early on in my career, I was involved, and I still am, with startups. And I think that is very important for our field, and you will see in my lecture, to always think ahead and to, to think out of the box. So what the truth is today, it will not be tomorrow, and it's possible that it's not be in one hour from now. So unless we're constantly reinventing ourselves and, and starting new things, uh, we're going to fall behind. Uh, and so when I, when I uh, did... Um, uh, the uh, entrepreneurship uh, with with the companies, I realized that I had a lot of fun, but I was really not at the same level uh, in the way of decision making and business decision making. Mm -hmm. And so I put that um, wish in a box and um, I put the box on my desk and I knew that I didn't have enough time. I couldn't really do, you know, my neurosurgery uh, profession. New York is a very tough environment. So, um, you know, uh, cultivating my practice and uh, uh, doing my research, NIH funded research, and also pursue an MBA and have a family. So the moment that my kids went to college, I opened up the box and my wish of doing the MBA was still there. Uh, and I took it all the way deep to my heart and I went to um, a couple of, of, of top schools uh, for executive MBA, and, and, and I was able to do that, and I'm really incredibly grateful. I also have to thank, I will not mention all the names, but there are at least a handful of other neurosurgeons that have done that throughout their career, later in their career, and that we are really um, inspiring to me, and uh, I, I think that has been a tremendous um, other tool in the box, because now, uh, when I uh, sit at the table, um, not just with a company, but even at my own uh, institution, hey, you know what? I am a physician, yes, but I'm also an MBA. So you can't quite um, you know, dismiss um, some of the statements that I make because they're not um, financially and or um, business uh, sound. So, and it's a lot of fun. You know, I really enjoyed it. I, I felt that being surrounded by um, people that are non-medical, uh, really brought a lot of knowledge into and a new dimension into into my life, uh, and I also think that because of that, I could be I can be a better physician now. Well, that's uh, really inspiring, actually, to hear that it's never too late to fulfill those wishes. And you know, I'm sure we all have things that we wish we could do. And it's, as I'm, you very well know, it's very challenging during residency in your early career to do everything that you're interested in. So. It's, Awesome to know you that there are people out there still pursuing those things later on in their career. Well, um, if you are ready, I think we can get to the to the meat of the talk and to your presentation. I, I do see your suit. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So thank you very much for um, hosting me today. It's a pleasure to be with you and with all the uh, young neurosurgeons. Uh, that are interested in brain tumors or maybe that are listening to this talk to see if potentially they could be interested. I thought that um, I could share with you some of the challenges of the uh, profession as well as the uh, opportunities. And uh, again, I am very uh, grateful to the Young Neurosurgeon uh, Committee of the uh, WFNS for the efforts uh, of putting together seminars that are available to um, people around the world. And with that said, I just wanna uh, give a few slides on the WFNS so that people that are just logging in um, might or might not know uh, what uh, this is um, and gain some, some knowledge into the uh, organization. So it is uh, an organization that was founded in um, 1955. It is a professional scientific non-governmental organization. We include 130 member societies, 
five continental associations, 119 national neurosurgery societies, and six affiliated societies. And uh, uh, we're representing over 30,000 neurosurgeons worldwide. The uh, president, uh, uh, current president, is Professor Franco Servade, and I know that he was one of your previous uh, speaker at this, uh, in this platform. The uh, mission of the WFNS is to promote global improvement in neurosurgical care by working together with the member societies to improve worldwide neurosurgical care, training, and research to benefit our patients around the world. Within the WFNS, uh, there are um, some uh, several committees, and you are one, the Young Neurosurgeon Committee. Uh, the committee that I chair is called the Education and Training Committee. I started chairing it in uh, 2017 and was asked to, to come up with a mission for the committee. And the mission is really aligned to that of the WFNS, and it is to facilitate neurosurgery education and training throughout the world with particular attention to LMIC by providing educational courses on site, online, web-based material, and publication. So what I'm doing today with the, with the, the Young Neurosurgeon Committee is uh, a, a dual responsibility. Uh, as part of the uh, education chair, but also because of me, because of Isabel Germano is passionate about uh, uh, oncology, uh, neurosurgery oncology. So um, uh, it is important to recognize that this is really a, a team effort. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the education and training committee is not uh, one person doing it, it is uh, over 30 members and all the names are listed and acknowledged on the slide. As you can see, we have an equal number of members um, in Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, North America, and South America with a very good representation of women, uh, which is really uh, something that is deep to my heart, as you can imagine. Now, what, is, what have we been doing and what, what is the um, um, kernel of our education and training? And, and as you can see, this can be divided into eight different components. Uh, we partner with neuroscience societies in some of the um, uh, LMIC countries. Neurosurgery is not quite yet a specialty, but it is more of a neuroscience, uh, uh, including uh, neurology and um, other um, specialties. Uh, we are also partnership with established um, societies, educational activity. Uh, as an example, the one in uh, uh, Turkey uh, that has been uh, going on for many years where they give free hands-on um, education once a year to people from Africa and Eastern Europe and Asia. We am, are empowering new neurosurgical societies. The one that is listed here in the slide is Togo, was their first meeting, historical meeting. We partner with uh, um, other neurosurgical societies and we also partner with continental societies so, such as CANS, ANS, ANS, and uh, Pan-Arab. Uh, naturally, we belong to the WFNS, so whenever there is a meeting, um, we uh, uh, have a, uh, a seminar and or hands-on uh, course there. Uh, we established new partnership with new uh, neurosurgical societies around the world and or uh, organizations that have been existing, but they have not been partnering with us before. And we're exploring new teaching opportunities. And I know that the uh, Young Neurosurgeon Committee uh, is pioneering some of those. So we're really happy to do some of those um, together. We did one last night for Argentina uh, with um, uh, Angelos, uh, your uh, chair, uh, part of it. So... As of December 2019, uh, this was uh, what we had uh, accomplished since um, September uh, 2017, 18 on-site courses. And we were planning for 14 more in the next uh, few months. And then we all know what happened. I don't have to describe what that little uh, creature that just appeared on the slide is, because unfortunately we all know. And so this is the map. And this is not a map of the planned courses, but this is a map, unfortunately, of the tragedy uh, of the pandemic that we all um, experienced. So we had to retool and reinvent. And clearly the easiest thing was to do this online. Uh, there uh, are some limitations because some of the hands-on uh, training cannot occur online, although we are very optimistic with, that with some of the new apps um, and some of the new technology, um, it, in the near future, I'm not saying next week, but in the near future, we can also do the training um, hands-on online. And so that was the little uh, preamble to, uh, to uh, the international um, involvement and the WFNS, which I think is a fantastic 
um, organization uh, that really uh, help us uh, all collaborating uh, with, uh, with each other. Let's talk about brain tumor surgery. As I told you, it is my passion, has been my passion for my entire career. And today I want to um, uh, share with you uh, the challenges of this um, subspecialty of neurosurgery. And I want to highlight them for you. And I want to convince you at the end of the talk, hopefully, that the challenges are actually opportunities. And that we can transform the challenges into opportunities. And so I hope that you're ready for the journey and I hope that you're gonna enjoy the ride. So let's um, talk about the incidence of primary brain tumors. Primary brain tumors are among the top 10 causes of cancer-related death in the US. You can see in the uh, um, rectangle highlighted in red in the, on the slide uh, that are actually um, one of the main uh, causes after major cardiovascular disease, um, diseases of the uh, uh, lung and uh, uh, bronchus, prostate in male, breast in women, and uh, uh, pancreatic disease. So, so it, it is not an uncommon disease and it's not a disease that does not cause death. You can see in the slide that I listed in the US, uh, uh, 13,000 um, uh, people uh, per year will uh, die of a brain tumor and uh, um, seven uh, people over 100,000 per year are uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor. On the left side of the slide, you see all those curves and you see a, a little uh, blue arrow that is pointing to the top curve. That is the cumulative uh, number of um, brain tumors. And um, the bottom part of the slide shows uh, in the distribution by age. And you can see that the vast majority of these brain tumors occurs between uh, 55 and up. And then uh, the second line from the top is a triangle that shows the um, incidence of meningioma. And the second one is a, a, the incidence of glioblastoma. So among um, the uh, uh, brain tumors, uh, um, so if we talk, only talk about primary brain tumor, glioblastoma is the most uh, um, uh, frequent. However, when we talk about all brain tumor, meningioma will be um, the top one. So back to primary brain tumors. So there are increasing. And uh, it is estimated that uh, in 2020, in the US, we have over um, 80,000 new cases. And approximately a third of those will be high-grade gliomas. As we described, uh, glioblastoma is the most uh, frequent one. The challenge of the tumor is that, of the tumors, uh, high-grade gliomas, is that there are very aggressive tumor, tumors because of their infiltrative nature. And on, on the uh, right slide, you, you see those um, tumor cells that are infiltrating the uh, surrounding parenchyma. So although on the left side, you see the MRI and uh, the patient will ask you, are you able, doctor, are you able to take it all out? And if you gave a crayon to the patient, the patient will be able to draw a line around the, the highlighted uh, contrast enhancing uh, lesion. The reality is that the histology is what we show on the, on the right. So it is an infiltrated tumor. The therapeutic efficacy has been very limited. Um, the, in, even with the best um, surgery, uh, radiation and chemotherapy is still uh, 40 months average life expectancy across the board. But I will show you that we made some progress in some subset um, of glioblastoma. And the reason why I put two politicians on the slide is just to remind us that this disease is um, affecting um, anyone and anybody. So it is really um, uh, across the board in, the, uh, um, in, in humanity. As, as I mentioned, because you asked me at the very beginning, yeah, I have uh, this uh, passion to um, really look um, not just at the disease, but also at what are the economic um, impacts of the disease that I care for. And what is economics? Economics is the study of how society uses its limited resources. And when I, when I lecture in a different parts of the world, I'm always uh, told, well, doctor, but in the US, you don't really have limited resources. And the answer is that's not correct, right? Through the pandemic, we just saw that it doesn't matter where you are, you could be in New York, you could be anywhere, resources are limited. And it is just a fact, um, and I'm showing water here, that water is a limited 
uh, has a limited amount. And, and there are some places where there is more, there are places where there is less, but by and large, it is limited. So we always have to wear that hat on how can we decrease the burden, the economic burden. And for brain tumors, I think that there are three ways. We can decrease the number of deaths, we can decrease the neurological disability due to the tumor, and we can decrease the cost of treatments. So what about deaths? Well, can we cure primary brain tumors? And the answer is with a gross total resection of a glioma or metastatic disease, we can accomplish a cure. Neurological disability, can we restore neurological function? Yes, we can, and I will show you how. Can we, um, by resecting the tumor, avoid new neurological deficits? Yes, we can, and I will show you how. And finally, how can we decrease treatment costs? This is a little bit of one of those where in business school we would say there is a return on investment. So it takes a little bit of an investment to understand what um, a patient specific treatment is all about. But once that we have it, then we can apply it to that patient population. And by so doing, we can decrease the cost. So the first question is, can we really improve outcome? by performing an aggressive resection of a um, newly diagnosed high-grade glioma? And the answer is yes. And there are many papers that have been accumulated uh, over the past 12 years, but this is probably one of the first one that was an evidence-based um, uh, pay, uh, paper showing that there was a beneficial survival in patients with complete resection, as opposed to those that uh, did not have uh, complete resection. And if we look, uh, if we um, uh, grade this by evidence-based medicine. This is a class 2B evidence, which in neurosurgery is really high. It is almost impossible to have a class 1 when it comes to surgery. So a class 2B evidence is really good. And so this paper inspired multiple centers to really have aggressive uh, resections and uh, multiple other papers have shown that the outcome uh, in, um, in uh, overall survival is improved by gross total resection. And here, in fact, is a um, recent um, review uh, confirming what I just uh, told you that, um, so this reviewed 10,000 uh, 10, uh, more patients and still was able to show um, that the original, one of the original paper in 2008 uh, was right. And that if we do aggressive resections, we increase overall survival. So let's go now to the, from this broad statistical analysis, which is always, okay, I get that, but what, what do I do with a patient like this, okay? So what do I do with a patient like this that is presenting with new onset of seizure disorder, um, has a um, very small lesion uh, at the bottom of the sulcus, um, and um, chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, CT that was negative, so it does not um, suggest any um, systemic uh, cancer. My um, recommendation for a patient like this is to bring him or her to the operating room and to perform a gross total resection for two reasons. Number one, the tumor doesn't belong there. The tumor is causing a significant amount of edema, and you can see that there. Um, and also the tumor is um, very easily approachable through a transalkyl resection. So here is the forcep on a very small craniotomy window that I prepared. I'm putting the forcep on the, on the brain. Uh, I cannot see where that tumor is, uh, but I do see that it is, um, my forcep is right on the top of the uh, sulcus. And I do know that if I follow that sulcus, if I do a transalkyl resection, I will be able um, to go down to remove the tumor, not to um, involve the cortex, and um, by so doing, not to cause a neurological um, deficit. And sure enough, um, the tumor is out. So um, we uh, have shown uh, that by um, doing minimally invasive uh, computer-assisted surgery, and multiple other investigators have, we decrease the length of stay, the number of neurological deficits. And Dr. Sawaya showed that for um, metastatic disease, you decrease the um, incidence of leptomeningeal disease uh, when that is done uh, unblocked. So multiple evidence that has been accumulating over the past 20 years. So yeah, I put this um, uh, at the bottom of the slide about neuro navigation. And so this is a concept that uh, we introduced many, many years ago. Uh, and um, this particular one shows uh, the use of the optical um, digitizer. In the US, I was uh, the first user in um, 
in the operating room. And as you can see at the very beginning, there were not too many centers that had it. And now I think that in most uh, uh, centers in, in North America and Europe, there is at least one, if not more, of, of these units. And there are also other uh, ways beside the optical digitizer that we can use to uh, perform minimally invasive resection. But the, the, the bottom line, the challenge is um, if you have a tool that is um, a good tool, uh, can you uh, perform safe surgery? And I think that to say a fool with a tool is still a fool, uh, it is very important because we need to recognize that brain uh, shift does happen. And so this is a picture of the brain uh, cortex that, um, with a microscope on, and you can see that at the very beginning of the surgery, the microscope is uh, perfectly focused on the little artery. And just by sitting there without doing anything, uh, within minutes, the um, focus of the uh, scope uh, gets out. And the reason is because there has been brain shift. And why does that happen? Because of CSF um, leakage, because of anest um, anesthesia and or, or PCO2 changes. And so very early on, we acknowledge that um, this uh, was done by one of uh, our chief residents, Dr. Ben Benisti, and show that if a tumor is larger than uh, 30 cc's, uh, there is a very light, high chance that there will be uh, some shift occurring and therefore uh, possibly uh, not a complete total resection. And therefore, um, we recommend that in those cases, uh, intraoperative uh, updates of the image uh, should be done either by ultrasound or by um, MRI. And so here you see the ultrasound that we had uh, initially coupled um, all the way back uh, with the uh, um, optic uh, digitizer. It's a very simple maneuver. Any ultrasound can be coupled. You just put the uh, LEDs on it. And then uh, what you do is you take an ultrasound at the beginning of the surgery. Here you can see that the lesion, um, the tumor that we are about to resect as, uh, is echogenic. And this is at the very beginning of uh, the surgery. You can fuse the ultrasound image with the preoperative uh, image to have a very good uh, registration. And then at the end of surgery, you will scan the brain again and you will see that the entire area of echogeneity is um, disappeared. And the reason why it's disappeared is because the tumor is taken out. And so this is an intraoperative uh, update. Now, even with the ultrasound, I still do the uh, MRI 24 hour after surgery just to um, confirm once again that it is a gross total resection. Another way to uh, help us updating uh, what we do uh, during surgery is the use of fluorescence. Um, there are multiple different ways. The abstract that I show here on the screen is something that we presented in 2017 at the AANS um, in other parts of the world, including Japan and Europe and Asia um, and Africa. Uh, 5ALA has been available for many years for us, was only approved in 2017 by our um, government, the FDA. Um, I want to review the uh, mechanism real quick because uh, it is slightly different than some of the other uh, fluorescent uh, uh, media that we have. This is a, um, a heme biosynthetic, so 5-ALA is part of the heme biosynthetic pathway in all mammalian cells and transformed by mitochondria in protoporphyrin um, 9, PP9. And that is a fluorescent metabolite. So what that does is that in normal cells, the uh, PP9 is chelated by ferrochelatase into heme. And the decreased levels of ferrochelatase in tumor cells combined with the increased cell density and increased blood-brain barrier variability allow for the increase of non-chelated PPIX, so well, PP9. So you, you see that um, the uh, uh, mechanism here is not just the breakage of the blood-brain barrier, but requires active metabol metabolism by the cells. And this is why it is different, let's say, than uh, fluorescein that um, on, it's only based on the extravasation due to BB um, breakage. And here is the diagram showing of what is happening in the infratumoral synthesis. And uh, uh, when you put the um, uh, fluorescence uh, light, uh, so the absorption wavelength is 440 nanometer, and you put that blue light, then the tumor will uh, fluoresce. The, the tumor cells that are uh, full with the uh, PP9. 
And so the, uh, it, it is a neural, medi um, a neural agent that you give the day of the uh, procedure. Here is how it's done. And in our uh, study, um, uh, it, it multiple other investigators showed that the sensitivity is pretty high, is in the high 90s across the board. So I think um, we will go uh, move uh, from um, uh, deaths to neurological disability. How can we um, restore neurological function and or um, avoid new neurological deficit? And here I'm challenging my own slide. And I hope that whenever you do um, prepare a talk and or whenever you go to the operating room and or whenever you wake up in the morning, you always challenge what you said the day before because this is the only way that we continue to evolve and improve. So I presented to you this slide and I said, does neurosurgical resection improve outcome in newly diagnosed GBM? And everybody, including myself, nodded the head and say, oh yeah, overall survival is improved. But is overall survival the only outcome parameter? And I would like to say that I challenge this statement and I say, no, it is not. It is important to have our patients living longer, but it is exceedingly important. Oops, this one, um, uh, part of this uh, escaped the uh, graph, but um, it is exceedingly important to preserve quality of life. So extent of resection and quality of life should go hand in hand. This is a great paper uh, out of the Journal of Pakistan Medical Association showing um, a few years ago that the role of extent of resection and quality of life is um, actually improved, uh, sorry, that the quality of life uh, in patients with newly diagnosed GBM is improved by aggressive resections. And there are many papers, and the reason why I picked this one uh, to show is because I also think that unfortunately, sometimes we try to always include the same papers and we try always to stick with one continent, whereas there is beautiful work that is done across the world, and we should start to acknowledge that more. So extent of resection can improve quality of life. How does it do that? It does do that in multiple ways. So when we look at um, uh, low-grade gliomas, for instance, we see that um, patients um, are often presenting with seizures in, in that uh, um, population, and that the um, operation removing the tumor without really doing epilepsy surgery, but just removing the tumor, will result in um, 75 um, or 73 or more percent of patients that uh, will um, result in having a decreased number of uh, seizures. And so there is, again, an association between the extent of resection with improved seizure outcome. And I do not show the evidence on this, but it's published in the literature that if you have less seizures, you have a much better quality of life for multiple reasons, including the fact that you can go to work, that you don't have to take um, heavy uh, anti-epileptic drugs, and so on and so forth. Now, seizures is one thing. The other thing is uh, motor deficits. And tumor cause motor deficits when they are in eloquent cortex. What is eloquent cortex? I think that the definition that I like is the one I have in the slide. It is brain um, for which other structures cannot take up function in the event of an injury. And that injury can be caused either by the tumor or by the neurosurgeon that is trying to take the tumor out. The concept of eloquent cortex is very important for epilepsy surgery, tumor resection, and AVM. So here um, is an example of a 55-year-old uh, woman that um, uh, is uh, presenting, as you can see, with this uh, drift and curling of the right hand. She has a left-sided uh, frontal tumor. The uh, MRI is shown in the slide, and you can see on the sagittal that the uh, lesion seems to be nested between broca, which is uh, anterior, and motor cortex central sulcus, which seems to be right posterior, but involved by that incredible amount of edema. I will play this uh, very short clip. And do you hear? Are you do you hear the uh, vid, the um, audio or no? You don't hear. Okay, well, I will tell you what I'm trying. What I'm doing here is very simple. I'm talking to the patient, and I'm asking her to straighten up her fingers, and she cannot straighten them up. Uh, she is uh, trying to speak, has difficulty finding words. So as you can see, she has an expressive aphasia. 
and she also has a dysarthria. She has difficulty uh, really enunciating and she's very, very slow in moving her phonation muscles. The reason why she has this bandage on the head is because in those days we were putting stickers on the head and so before the surgery I would keep them on the head to avoid that they were un undone on the way to the operating room. So this is um, before surgery, right? And so where is that tumor loca located? Why does this patient have a deficit? Here is the appenfield homunculus and you can see that um, because this tumor is nested between broca and moro, the edema here is involving the phonation muscles and it is involving the lower part of the face and it is all the way up to the thumb and a, a rule of thumb coincidentally I use the same word is that when you go 4.5 centimeter up from the sylvian fissure and here's the sylvian fissure is where the uh, um, representation of the thumb is so um, she had that plus right because here is more than 4.5 so she had the entire hand that um, had a, a motor deficit. And the difficulty, so with phonation we described, but there is also difficulty in expression. Here is the Broca area, so the edema is also pushing against Broca and um, she has um, that uh, deficit. So is the, she was referred to me because um, in the community this was thought to be an um, inoperable tumor. Is this inoperable? No, this is very operable and this is the kind of tumor where you can reverse the deficit if you operate uh, right away. Why? because most um, glioblastomas are de novo glioblastoma, meaning that occur, their growth occurs super fast. They don't derive from an infiltrated tumor and therefore they cause um, deviation of the fibers and or by edema, like in the case I showed you, there are displacing those fibers. So in both of these cases on the left, deviation and or edema, if you remove the pink mass, the tumor, you will restore the neurological function. This is totally different than in this case, uh, and that is pertinent to the low grade and or uh, to the uh, low grade that they evolve to a higher grade, where the tumor is uh, mixed with the uh, um, white matter fibers and the uh, um, brain parenchyma, uh, and in that case, you cause infiltration and destruction, so the surgery does not revert that deficit. Um, it is just an aside on DTIs because I know that a lot of people um, comment uh, when I give lectures on brain tumors and say, well, in the United States, you're very lucky because you have additional guidance, you can use DTIs. In some of the countries, we do not have it. And I say that DTI is a great tool that we have, but similar to the other slide, what I show you, a, a, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Um, this is beautiful work that was done by uh, Sonia Pujol at the Brigham in Boston. And she showed uh, that the same MRI set sent to 10 academic um, universities in the United States resulted in the graphic representation of the corticospinal tract in 10 different ways. And so you can imagine that if you work in this institution on the top left, you will receive this and you're gonna use that for your guidance. Whereas if you work in the second row uh, in this institution right here, this is what you will be given as your guidance. So which one to believe? It's amazing, right? So sometimes, you know, um, evidence-based um, data is important, but I also believe that looking at this, this beautiful work that Sonia did is, is fascinating and needs to be uh, complemented and kept in mind that before you start using those DTIs, you really need to understand how are they um, uh, truthfully representative. And how can you do that? You have to do the intraoperative mapping yourself and see uh, whether or not there is a correlation. So this is just the caveat. But being as it may, here we are in the operating room and um, uh, we are planning uh, for this surgery. I um, like to do this surgery with um, ECOG and also with um, uh, SSCP just to confirm uh, that um, my tumor is in front of central sulcus. Here is the uh, post-op MRI. This is the, um, sorry, preoperative MRI, post-operative MRI. And uh, this is the patient in the office. And as you can uh, see, she's able to squeeze uh, my finger. So her um, deficit is uh, significantly improved. Her facial asymmetry is also improved. And I don't know if this will play, but uh, she's also speaking super, uh, super fast. 
The other thing that I want to um, bring up to your attention is that it's very important to remove the tumor in big blocks uh, because uh, we need that for uh, pathology and I will show you how this is becoming more and more important. So somatosensory evoke potential is what I use when I want to uh, confirm um, motor versus sensory. It's a very easy technique, um, very inexpensive. It is uh, measuring the um, um, latency and uh, we're looking at phase reversal. And you can see um, here where phase reversal is. Uh, so the electrodes that are um, uh, in front and uh, posterior to that indicates the uh, motor and sensory cortex. In honor of our of your president, uh, the president of the uh, uh, Young Neurosurgeon uh, Committee, I um, I'm showing this, and I actually show it even when I don't speak for the uh, uh, Young Neurosurgeon Committee, because um, in in our culture, Hippocrates really is uh, one of the pillars of uh, of medicine, and I think that um, in our uh, country, um, the uh, uh, main um, take home message that we attribute to Hippocrates is um, do not harm. Uh, however, what he said is askein peri ta nosomata duo ophelein e meblatein. Many years of uh, ancient Greek um, uh, that was uh, imposed uh, upon me by my parents, so I did it without questioning. But basically, um, what this says is that when you're looking at the diseases, there are two things that you do. And the first one is not do not harm, but the first one is to do good. So we need to remember that. We need to remember that, um, and this is very true for brain tumor surgery, is that we want to provide um, the cure uh, for the patient and the best that um, that patient can possibly have. And by doing so, we have to be sure that we're not hurting them. But both of them are very important. And so how can we do good? I think that we can do good and also not harm if we understand that um, we always need to be very precise in locating where that tumor is ahead of time. Um, and uh, the goals of our surgery are to find the lesion and resect it uh, to do good, but also to maintain the function after the resection is done to avoid the deficit. And the question is, when do we need um, uh, brain mapping and what kind of brain mapping? And how? And the answer is we always need brain mapping, but that doesn't, need, doesn't mean that you need to do it intraoperatively. You could do it before. So let's look at this paper published by Dr. Berger in 1990 showing um, two examples, one of a tumor that uh, is um, not only in front of central sulcus, but a whole gyrus ahead, and the other one that is definitely infiltrated. As you see, Dr. Berger performed um, an awake uh, craniotomy or, or intraoperative mapping in both cases. And one could make the cause now, 20 years later or 30 years later, that um, if you have intraoperative guidance, remember this is 1990, and I showed you that the very beginning of the uh, use of intraoperative guidance occurred in 1993, at least in the US. So now that we have accumulated all this experience, we can probably say that the case on the left, um, you can do a quick SSCP, confirm that you're in front of central sulcus, and then perform it with um, intraoperative guidance without going through the extent of a full uh, awake mapping, whereas, um, uh, or brain uh, in, uh, cortical stimulation, whereas this one is clearly one that is infiltrating the eloquent area and does require intraoperative uh, mapping. So when is uh, mapping indicated? And again, the concept of limited resources, the cost benefit analysis, um, this is an international uh, seminar. So um, uh, some of it is in French, uh, my, my mother language, um, but with a Greek word, a word oikos, maison, a house. Uh, it, it, uh, the economy really um, uh, stems from the word oikos, which is really taking care of the house because that's what the, in those days it was. And so for neuro-oncology, that is the parenthesis, you know, when it's indicated, and I think that it is important to understand if a tumor is acute versus chronic, because that will make a difference between demarcated versus infiltrated in the majority of cases. And also the MRI can help us with that. The MRI has been incredibly helpful because um, it shows us not just the anatomy, but uh, some of the function of the brain. And whereas at the very beginning was just uh, very simple functions such as speech and or um, um, uh, motor and sensory, um, 
data accumulating over the past 20 years has shown that uh, th there are many more complex circuitry and that we can recognize those uh, such as language syntactic processing, um, musical syntax, uh, perception of rhythmic motion and so on and so forth. Now, is it really that important to know what my musical syntax in my brain is? Probably not because I'm not a musician. Um, I enjoy music, but I cannot play anything. So if you did surgery on me to spend all that money and all that time to make sure that my musical syntax is preserved at the end of surgery, probably not that important. With that being said, if you're operating on a musician, it's very important to acquire that information. And I wanna make the point that we can't constantly use all the tools for all the patients. We need to know that they are available and to use them as appropriate and also to and get to know that patient and see what is important to him, right? So if I have a dancer, it's important for her to have this rhythmic motion preserved at the end of the procedure. So I wanna know that. Again, patient specific, we wanna invest the uh, technology when it is important for that particular patient, not just to say that we did it, unless we are doing research and that's a different story. We are all different, we're all unique and our needs are all different as well. So um, the first mapping is very simple. We need anatomical triplanar images, axial, sagittal, and coronal. I also like the 3D because they really help um, me and um, showing uh, my residents exactly where the tumor is. And I also like the trajectory views that are in most uh, um, simulators because they tell you if you, if you hold the instrument in a certain way, how will you land on the tumor? So those are the um, images that one should always um, review prior to the surgery. Let's look at another example. This patient had a biopsy. You can see on the left side, the little uh, black dot is where the biopsy was done at a different institution. And then a few years later, she came to us with an enhancing lesion that is now shown with that uh, red uh, uh, mark. Uh, clearly, um, this tumor was uh, ch changed in, um, in uh, uh, radiographic uh, appearance and most likely in grade. Um, you can see the uh, MRI here and you can see that the enhancing part of the uh, nodule where the red mark is, is deep into the cilium fissure and most likely it is uh, in Broca. So in this particular case, the functional MRI is very important. You can see the images prior to processing showing the finger tap. You can see here the mute count up and the mute count down. And the reason why it's important to have a mute is because if you move your lips, you're actually uh, mapping for motor and not for broca. And you can see that the tumor was embedded in broca. Again, caveat, functional MRI, um, we all know that is based on the bold uh, principle, which means that as the blood flow increases, there is an increase in oxygen consumption that will uh, in turn um, result in decrease of the oxyhemoglobin. And the relative increase and decrease correlates with the T2 relaxation. And this is how we originate the data. Now, the question is, this is fantastic in normal individuals, but what about in two patients that have brain tumors where we know that autoregulation is impaired? How inaccurate is functional MRI? And the answer is here in the slide. The concordance between functional MRI and intraoperative uh, cortical stimulation, ICS, ranges between 61 and 100%. So if you remove the 100%, which is never true in medicine, but if you say it's between 61 and 96 or 97 percent, you see that the range is pretty, is pretty um, uh, vast. And here you see a very good example where the uh, functional MRI had uh, shown that the central sulcus was where the um, error is and instead intraoperative uh, stimulation showed that it was um, in a different uh, location. Uh, why? Because of the presence of the tumor. So again, functional MRI, great tool, but you need to uh, each time reconfirm it in, in the operating room, at least as you're gaining the experience at your own institution. So in this uh, particular case, this is a case that I will do awake. So we go back to that um, um, patient with the very small enhancing um, area of enhancement within a much broader tumor. I put a laryngeal mask, I do intraoperative uh, awake uh, stimulation, and if I play the, the video, you're not gonna hear, but basically we're waking her up, we remove the laryngeal mask, we stimulate until when we get um, three uh, positive uh, stopping of the language. When that is um, 
uh, when that happened, uh, I uh, resect the tumor again in large uh, pieces to send it to a uh, pathology. And then um, here's the post-op MRI showing a, a gross total resection. And here I will not play, but you can see that the patient is very happy. Uh, she's smiling. And by the way, this patient and the other patient, you see that um, they have their um, hair uh, on. I don't shave the hair uh, for surgery. Uh, both this patient and the previous one are seven days after surgery. So they both agreed for me to show this at a webinar. However, they told me that their hair, to say that their hair is not coiffed. So they look much prettier. Uh, if I, they would look much prettier if I had allowed them to, um, shave, to sorry, to uh, shampoo the hair, but I don't until when I take the stitches out. So for this particular case, as you saw, I did direct cortical stimulation. Here are the parameters that I use. I uh, increase the current until when I induce after discharges, and the optimal current is below um, the AD threshold. Um, the uh, instrument to use is a very simple one. It's called the Algeman uh, stimula uh, st uh, cortical stimulator. The advantages of the uh, um, cortical mapping is that uh, you can have a very detailed uh, mapping. You need to leave the arm out. You can induce seizures, so always have cold uh, saline on the operating room table, so you can extinguish that electrographic seizure if you see it. Much faster to do that with cold water than with um, uh, anti-epileptic drugs intravenously. And the uh, um, a uh, caveat is that, unfortunately, if you're using current that is too high, you can spread the current through the U-fiber, and you can actually stimulate in one gyrus, but, um, sorry, you can, yeah, um, put the, uh, the stimulator on one gy gyrus, but the current is shunted into the other one, so the the um, result that you're observing is not of the gyrus that you are uh, stimulating, but of the one that is adjacent to it. And so again, this could lead you into an error. And then cortical stimulation does require larger openings than SSCP. So a cartoon um, to kind of frame what we have been uh, saying, uh, there are three ways that we can do brain mapping. The first one is the anatomical configuration. The second one is the functional determination. And the third one is resection control. So the first anatomical configuration, the basics really are the uh, axial coronal and sagittal MRIs before and after contrast. You can add all the other uh, things that you want. Uh, functional MRI, I didn't speak about uh, advanced um, images such as perfusion, permeability, and ASL because this will be a whole other um, talk by itself. Uh, but we do those uh, when indicated. We can use your DTI if you like. You can use a spectroscopy. You can use uh, PET and uh, magnetoencephalography. Not for all patients, but when indicated. And then if you determine that um, you um, need to obtain additional functional determination, then is when you will uh, use your intraoperative um, uh, uh, mapping. And uh, in, inside the uh, surgery, you will also need to have uh, some understanding of resection control. And, and you can do that with the uh, methods that uh, we saw, such as um, ultrasound and uh, fluorescence. Um, bottom line, always remember um, to ask yourself, do I do it all? And the answer is no, never. Um, what is reasonable and what makes um, common sense? And so we go to the last uh, few minutes of, of the talk, and that is how can we um, help the economic burden of brain tumor disease by controlling cost? right? And one of the costs is really treatment. Why? Because we have shown over and over again in medicine, forget about brain tumors, that if patients are receiving the wrong treatment, there, there are two costs that we have to pay. One is because we're giving, it's costing us to give a treatment that is not um, efficacious. And number two, because some of those patients will also um, uh, have complications uh, secondary to the treatment. And, and that is a whole additional cost, very important to avoid it, right? And so um, patient-specific treatment, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, it takes um, an investment, and then you have to see what is the ROI, return of investment, after that investment is uh, placed. And I think that for, for this, it, it, it makes sense that in countries where um, there is more um, economic availability, um, that effort is put into, but then the treatment, when the treatment becomes available, then is available for the rest of the world. 
Radio surgery. Is radio surgery a good tool for um, brain tumors? And the answer is yes and no. So for some of the meningiomas, for the acoustic neuromas, the answer is absolutely yes. For the um, high-grade gliomas, unlikely. We, pub we and others published on, on this. And the answer is that this is, as we said, a more infiltrative glioma, infiltrative tumor, so it requires a broader field as opposed to the concept that you're seeing on the slide of being uh, very focused. However, there are uh, some uh, uh, cases where um, that could be appropriate. Uh, it just appeared on the left corner, uh, a book that I was asked by the AANS to write many years ago, comparing linac base and gamma um, knife base radiosurgery. And all the way back then, we showed that there was really no difference between the two technology. And um, after that book, many other papers accumulated showing that it really doesn't matter which machine you're using, as long as you're using uh, the principles that are guiding to the treatment. And so something new about the radio surgery that we're learning from the cancer community is that um, it is possible that um, uh, there is an obstacle effect that is induced by uh, radiation, which is uh, something that is referred to as uh, mediated by immune uh, system. And so in this cartoon, what you see is that the local radiation can cause tumor cell death which is followed by adaptive immune system recognition, not unlikely a vaccine. This is still a concept that is being developed. I cannot present you with evidence-based medicine. So if you're interested in exploring this, it will be good uh, done together with um, other um, individuals and or institutions that are looking into it as a clinical trial and or as a, uh, um, sorry, as a prospective uh, um, group. I told you at the very beginning of the talk that uh, there is still uh, 14 months of survival, but I also said, wait, because in some subgroups, we have improved the survival. And here you can see in the original paper by Dr. Stoop that when the importance of the methylation of the MGMT promoter was uh, recognized, that those patients that were uh, MGMT methylated um, uh, there was uh, uh, the rate at two years uh, was much higher than those that were not methylated. So they survived uh, much longer than uh, um, the other ones. So there is a subcategory of patients that uh, does better uh, when they have the MGMT methylation um, of the uh, promoter. And so what that prompted is uh, the understanding that it is very important not just to classify tumors by their look, but to look into the uh, molecular signature. And this is the paper that came out from the WHO in 2016. Um, the paper is there, so please, after the lecture, uh, review it in, in detail. I can't do that here. But just to show that, whereas before finding cells like this that look like a fried egg appearance would make the pathologist call this an oligo, this, that it's, it's not longer part of the, uh, of the uh, new uh, classification system because for it to really be an oligo, you need to have uh, that co-deletion. And if not, then it would be a different type of tumor. And also there are multiple other molecular signatures that we can identify. And those are uh, prognostic, um, prognostic uh, uh, markers. So um, we go by um, histopathologic classification, um, we go by diagnostic image. Um, we uh, then uh, look at uh, what happens after uh, treatment, um, surgical treatment, when the tumor recurs. And that is what is frustrating to the neurosurgeons because we do this to the neurosurgeons and neurooncologists and the radiation oncologists because really to have a neurooncology program, you need all three disciplines. So the frustration comes from the stems from the fact that these tumors, especially the high grade gliomas are uh, coming back. And, the, and um, the reason why they're coming back are multiple and I will go um, to those in a second. But what we do know now is that if we know what the molecular signature is, we can then, when the tumor recurs and or sometimes ahead of time, use targeted uh, therapy. And what is targeted therapy? It is um, therapy that will act on those molecular signatures that we were able to identify by uh, performing additional studies on the tissue. And here is a slide cartoon that summarizes some of those uh, signatures. Now, why do tumor recur? Well, 
there are possibly multiple reasons. One that we another identified is the presence of um, stem um, st uh, glioma stem cells, right? So th the first question is, what is tumorigenesis? Where are brain tumors coming from? There are still three theories that are probably all coexisting. One was introduced by Dr. Bignami when he introduced the uh, um, GFA, uh, uh, GFAP, uh, showing that the glia uh, can undergo mutation, uh, and become abnormal glia, and then give tumor. And the reason why he made that observation uh, 30 or 40 years ago is because um, he showed that low-grade gliomas are GFAP positive, and then when they get to glioblastoma, uh, some of those glioblastoma cells do lose the uh, GFAP positivity. So that was introduced many years ago. The other one that it was introduced more recently is the concept of a stem cell. And in, in brain tumor, we will call that a glioma stem cell that undergo mutation and then uh, becomes a um, uh, brain tumor uh, stem cell. And then the third one is a mutation of a precursor cell, a neuroprogenitor cell that mutates into the tumor. And all this coexists most likely, and also the microenvironment, epigenetics, and metabolism play a significant role. And some of those roles are still in the process of being developed. This is work that I've done with Dr. Binello, who at the time was a resident um, uh, with us and in my lab. So what is the new, the new tool, right? We have all this stuff. How can we go ahead of ourselves? How can we not fall behind? One way is to look at what is there um, outside of, of those cells that I just showed you. And one thing that is there that is available to all of us is artificial intelligence. Why is artificial intelligence pertinent to neuro-oncology? Because there is more and more data that we need to analyze and more and more data that is available. Um, we're running out of time, so I will go very, very fast, but in these next few slides, you will see that data for healthcare comes from very different places, electronic medical record, wearable, the human genome sequences, and we, we should really take advantage of all of that and use it for our patients. We published um, recently another published on machine learning, quick slide on uh, what is the definition of machine learning. It's an application of artificial intelligence that is based on a field of computer science that gives computer the ability to learn from big data without explicitly being programmed. And within machine learning, uh, we have a, um, uh, also neuronal network and deep learning. We will not touch upon, but let's just um, stay on the machine learning thing. So machine learning could be supervised or unsupervised. Supervised mean that you tell the machine, here are my 10 patients. The outcome of these patients is that some had an MI and some did not. Put all the data in, and now you're asking the machine, give me a, give me, um, a, uh, a diagram of which are the patients, the prognostic indicators that will predict that those patients uh, have uh, or will have an, an MI. So you teach the machine how to analyze the data. The unsupervised um, uh, way is that you put all the data into the machine and then the machine can come up with different observations that you yourself would have not been able to input. And this is improving our ability to learn a large amount of what we call nonlinear data. It is also known as big data. <clears throat> So this is the paper that uh, we uh, published with um, Chris at that time. He was a chief resident uh, in my program. And what we showed there was that machine learning for neuro-oncology has been uh, used um, and has been used for three things. Outco outcome uh, prediction, image analysis, and gene expression. <coughs> you see in this table, the um, papers that used um, machine learning for a patient outcome predictor, quite a few, and they're um, all able to uh, identify uh, predictors of uh, survival that otherwise could have not been um, predicted. And the other thing that is fascinating about um, uh, uh, machine learning is uh, radiomics and the ability to really process the images and um, being able to let us know ahead of time even some of the molecular markers. So now we're thinking out of the box, is it possible that we're gonna be able to do those quote unquote biopsies just with the MRIs? And it is, I think, very likely that we're gonna be in that uh, situation. The other thing that um, uh, machine learning is very helpful for is to help us differentiating between progression and tumor progression. And that clearly um, uh, will help us understanding without the use of a, of a biopsy. 
whether or not we need a treatment change and or continue the treatment. Last concept, right? We love scalpels. I am the happiest uh, part of my day is when I am in the operating room. But as a new oncologist, I know that um, not just my surgical scalpel will help my patient with brain tumors, and there are other things that I can do, and those things I do in my lab, and uh, um, are um, stemming from the frustration of the tumor coming back, as we said. The fact that uh, we do have glioma stem cells that are regenerating our tumor, and the fact that it's difficult to get to the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. So uh, all the way back uh, 15 years ago or so, we started using embryonic stem cells and now we changed into uh, in, uh, human induced pluripotent stem cells to use those as vectors to carry pro-apoptotic gene in the brain. Um, a few slides just to show you the incredible amount of work and all the um, people, lead people in my lab that uh, produce the word I recognize with a picture and, the, and, the, uh, and their names on the paper to show that taking a fibroblast, a skin fibroblast from a patient, we were able to uh, de-differentiate de it into an astrocyte. Those astrocytes had the same characteristics of normal astrocytes. We were able to implant those in the uh, in the brain of the mouse and show that they have uh, uh, migration uh, uh, activity. They can go recognize the tumor and cluster around the tumor. And so what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that it is um, possible and, and we're um, very close to um, do a clinical trial on this uh, to uh, um, remove the tumor, obtain a skin biopsy, and then uh, um, uh, de differentiate the fibroblast into an induced pluripotent stem cell and then introducing a pro apoptotic gene, as we have shown in the lab, clone uh, those uh, uh, cells and keep them ready, uh, de differentiating them into astrocytes, keep them ready so when and if the patient recurs with a brain tumor, we can re resect and implant uh, the vectors to deliver uh, gene therapy directly into the brain. And differently from all the gene therapy that has been done up until this moment, this will be patient specific because those cells do belong to the same patient that we're taking out from. So in conclusion, here are the challenges for brain tumor surgery. They're increasing in number, they're infiltrative in nature. Um, we have limited therapeutic efficacies um, and extent of resection is challenging. The economic burden revolves around the quality of life and the um, overall survival. The uh, artificial intelligence is uh, not uh, um, uh, free of um, challenges. Uh, we're still learning uh, from it. And uh, uh, patient-specific treatments are still being developed. So what I would like to say is that these are not challenges. These are all opportunities that we should uh, embrace and run with and improve the, pay, the care of our patients. My last slide uh, shows a very um, dear project to my, uh, my heart that I hope all of you will download. Um, and uh, this is a book that was published recently. The ebook is free of charge. Uh, we have it in 10 languages. We have 10 more that will be uploaded soon. Um, it is a book that uh, four uh, children uh, wrote to show that if you like something, you should pursue it. And if you like brain tumor surgery, please pursue it because it's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Germano, for that wonderful talk. Um, I think we all learned a lot and it's exciting to see both what has been happening recently in the past uh, few decades and then where this field is going in the future. Um, at this point, I don't see any, oh, here we go. We have a question in the Q&A. Oh, it says, thank you very, very much. Um, if we don't have any questions from the audience at this point, uh, I can just ask a few questions that we prepared um, to just kind of wrap up the presentation, if that's okay with you. Thank you, Megan, sure. Yeah, um, so it sounds like you've been a pioneer in oncologic surgery in, in so many ways. And one of the things that I was most interested in um, from your talk is the fact that you were one of the first surgeons or potentially the first surgeon in the U.S. to do certain techniques and use certain intra-op um, imaging guidance. And my question is, how did you approach your first time doing these new procedures, these new techniques? And what discussions did you have with your colleagues um, 
both surgeons and also the people in the room to kind of prepare that and make everyone comfortable with doing something that was novel for the first time. Yeah, this is a very, um, very important question. So uh, in, in the US, um, whenever you use something that is uh, new, um, has to be FDA approved, or you need to have a, an approval uh, from the FDA to use it for that particular goal. And so we had um, the latter. And then um, you have to go through the institutional board reviews and make sure that um, your IRB uh, approves uh, the study and you have to inform the patient with an informed consent. So all those things uh, for us are incredibly important. And, and I think that even in countries where maybe um, the rules and regulations are not as uh, strict, uh, I would strongly recommend uh, my colleague to my colleagues across the world uh, to be sure that you discuss uh, everything ahead with the patient. And then um, there is a lot of training that needs to be done uh, with the uh, with the nurses, with the with the staff. And I think that the best way is to engage them and to try to explain uh, what is the purpose of all this, right? So um, the purpose is not to make money, but the purpose is to help uh, our patients now and in the future. And finally, I think your question was, what about your other colleagues? Like you said in the introduction, I, I uh, thought um, computer-guided, uh, uh, image-guided uh, neurosurgery in New York, across the world, uh, within my uh, organization, CNS and WNS, for over 10 years until when this was uh, adopted um, by, by, I would say, most uh, centers. So if you believe in something and if you have good results, it's very important to also spend the time uh, to show our colleagues uh, what can be done with the technology. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Did you ever experience any pushback when trying to incorporate these um, new techniques or these new images into your practice? So I, the way in which I lead uh, is by example. I would never tell one of my partners what, what to do. Uh, I would use it uh, for my surgeries and then if um, if other people are interested in learning and they will use it that's great um, but I would never um, say that this is standard of care. Sure, sure. Um, we have a question from the audience actually. Uh, how do you recommend that we incorporate what you've talked about and achieve these goals for brain tumor resections and brain tumor surgery in uh, low and middle income countries and um, how do, how do we do these you know, high-end techniques in potentially places that have lower resources? Yeah, so I, I think that I try throughout my talk to explain that you do not need every single toy in the world. And that the first thing we need to do is to do good. So if, if you have, um, so again, um, can you perform brain tumor surgery without an MRI, just with a CT? The answer is yes and no. Uh, yes and no, because if it is an emergency, clearly you will do that surgery. If it is a meningioma, CT is perfect, right? If the only thing you have is a CT, I would say that in the vast majority of cases, you can operate a meningioma with a CT. If you have a primary brain tumor, um, the CT might not uh, be enough, especially for those that do not enhance. So, if you feel that the, the, what you have is going to result in hurting the patient, maybe that is um, a surgery that you should not be doing. Um, but again, it's very difficult to make um, generalized comment. If you have an MRI, I would say that the vast majority of tumors can be operated with that MRI pretty safely and uh, that it would be good to implement um, over time, I know that it, it is a little bit of uh, investment, but implement the possibility to do some direct cortical stimulation because that doesn't require too much equipment and it's relatively inexpensive. Excellent. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have right now, unless our audience has anything, anything else they'd like to add, we can always let you um, unmute yourselves as well. Um, but we wanted to just thank you again, Dr. Germano, for joining us this morning, giving such an excellent talk. And um, for everybody who's watching now or may have joined us late, uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be put up on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming weeks as well for review. And uh, thank you again for joining us, Dr. Germano. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure. Us as well. Have a good morning, everybody.